Thomas for agreeing to this interview. Uh, most of us know you um, as the person who was responsible for composing the music to the national anthem. Take us back a bit into the process of how you created the melody that's now sung at every major national event and, and at other events. Uh, <clears throat> it's a difficult question to answer, <laughs> really, because um, I recall in the first instance, Father Jess sort of wrote to me and uh, I wondered, well, why did he write? I looked at the two-page thing, and there was a second page, and all I noticed was a poem. So then uh, I went back and read the first page, and then realized he was drawing my attention to the fact that the government had invited persons to submit contribution by way of music and words to the national anthem. And he was in fact saying, I have just done the words and I would like you to set it to music. Now, uh, <clears throat> there was this close relationship between Father Jess and myself ever since I grew up in Viewfort. In fact, I was a member of the boys choir and he taught me music. And then I came up to Castries as a result of his influence because he thought I had some musical skill and he needed me to carry this further. At that time, there was a director of music appointed by the name of Mr. Chester Catlow. And I was doing studies with Mr. Chester Catlow in music. So Father Jess knew I was doing quite a bit of compositions for various things in church. So it was difficult for me to tell him that, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> do this. So I read the poem Several times I tried to enter into the spirit, the length, the meter, and all that goes with it. And when I thought I understood it well enough, then I commenced writing a melody. <clears throat> now, it is very difficult to say, uh, how do you write a melody? Yes. There are <laughs> canons in terms of what makes a good melody and things like that. But eventually, you've got a whole history and background of music tunes, you know, in your repertoire, mm -hmm. as it were. And then you begin to say, well, what kind of tune would sort of reflect that? Because the music must add and in help to interpret the spirit of the words. And I spent something like three weeks, you know, trying to, to solve that yes. problem. Eventually I did and wrote out a melody that I thought I was comfortable with. It satisfied the canons I thought of melody and harmony at that time as far as um, I was concerned. So I sent it to him and then he said, well, could we get together so that he could hear the tune? So I agreed and I went to the cathedral with him and I played the tune on the organ. And then when I came down from the choir loft, he said he liked it. Mm. And he then submitted it to the government. And there was a panel because it was a, a competition. Ah. <laughs> and then the panel recommended this anthem and so the word to government. <laughs> yes. And therefore, history was made. And then... Uh, shortly after, when it got nearer to independence, I remember that there was a function at Government House and they wanted a choir to sing that anthem, you know, prior so that persons could hear it yeah, what was in that its fullness. Like? Yes. <laughs> yes. So that was very interesting. And uh, so how did that's you, it. But how did you feel hearing your composition for the first time? Yes. <clears throat> Well, it was good, I think, um, to think that you have done something and it is considered to be a value to the nation, you know, to be recommended by a committee and then, you know, to do this. So I was very, very delighted. But it was only, um, you know, several years after when you begin to hear it being played and especially with various other 
national anthems, like when they brought people from various territories and they played the several yeah. anthems, you began to feel, yes. you know, yeah. that and this you had was, created that. Had created, and yes. it was worthwhile. Well, but you've had a love affair with music of sorts because <coughs> I gather that you studied in London, London College of Music. You were the choral director and, uh, and organist at the Roman Catholic Cathedral, and you're also the vice president of the Seminary School of Music from 89 to 92. Yeah. Um, this love affair began in view for it while learning uh, to sing on the choir. That's right. Yeah. At least we had a boys' choir then. And um, I started learning music there. At that time, father taught us how to read, and we could sight read both the plain chant, which was, you know, church music, uh, conventional church music at the time, and then we could sight read modern music, you know. At that time, it was a delight for us to be able to pick up anything and sight read it. Just do it, yeah, yeah. Just do Did it. you ever think of becoming a musician? Because, I mean, you, you went to me to study yeah. music. And, Sounds uh, pretty serious. That was a a problem for me, uh, quite a tussle. Yeah? Because I had these two loves, as it were, music and education. And um, <clears throat> after I did the London matric, I thought, well, let me give some thought to doing music seriously and wanted to do a degree in music. And uh, I was doing the subjects with the help of Mr. Catlow in terms of musical composition, counterpoint, harmony, form, analysis, and um, I got somewhere with it. In fact, I had applied for admission to the University of London <laughs> you know, in order to do music. And then <clears throat> something happened. The year after I um, succeeded my London matriculation examination, Mr. Boxill, you know, pulled me over to the Ministry of Education to be one of the supervising teachers, which essentially is a trainer of teachers, teacher trainer. And from then on, I began to have second thoughts, you know. And I thought, well, at the time, St. Lucia didn't seem ready for somebody who would come back with a degree in, in music. music. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. And I thought, Perhaps I should pursue my education because I had got further along the, the road in that area and uh, keep music as an abiding interest, I see. And which is what has happened yeah, to I this day. To I have nev not given it up at all. Oh, you still play? I still play. I you still make up um, other uh, anthems? Right. And, <laughs> and, and you compose whatnot. at all? Um, yes, I, I, yes, I do a little compositions yes, here and so there. Well. I've done a lot for for, for church yes. in terms of various things. Right. But, um, but you haven't regretted your choice? No, no, I haven't. Not at all. Not at all. Okay, let's talk about the other love affair with <laughs> education. Um, what, what drew you? I mean, was it just this, this, this um, Mr. Boxer's intervention, of, you know, became a teacher trainer, yeah. and from there, or before that, you sort of had an inkling that you wanted to be an educator? Yes. I... <clears throat> Yes, teaching has always been one of my interests ever since I was a youngster. So I was also a teacher at Beaufort. Mm. Why? Why I, were you as a youngster interested in teaching? Well, I think um, it's difficult to say because there are a number of things I was interested in, like in uh, the music, and uh, there was only about one or two people in Beaufort at that time with instruments mm -hmm. that you could listen to. Uh, the other thing was teaching, because you saw the nuns, you saw schoolmaster, you saw, and the community looked up to a mm -hmm. teacher at that time. So you felt, well, that, that must be something and worthwhile. Prestige, yes, and, 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 and so forth, you know. And, um, <clears throat> and that um, sort of drew my interest. And I recalled, you know, at one time, I was having second thoughts about it and consulted my father. And uh, he gave me some very good advice, and I stayed in teaching yes. as a result of the advice. <laughs> okay, the advice was? <laughs> the advice was, um, if you're escaping it in order to avoid difficulties, then wherever you go, difficulties would arise. Right. 
but if you love what you're doing, you'll overcome the difficulties. And I thought that was so very useful. Okay, and so that's how you began and this affair how, with education. That's how I began. All right, now you mentioned, of course, you were a teacher trainer in uh, <coughs> 1950, I believe, yeah. and then you were inspector of schools in 57 to 61, then chief education officer in 1961 to 72. Yeah. Now, why I'm quoting these years is that I want your perspective of the education system back then, okay. as somebody who was so integrally involved in it. All right. <coughs> well, let me say a few things, if you don't mind, no before I get to this. Because <clears throat> I spent almost 48 years as a public servant. And uh, of that 14 years, I spent 14 years as a teacher. Uh, the remaining years, were in educational administration. So I've had a pretty long period in educational administration. I also had periods during which <clears throat> I moved away from St. Lucia for a short while in order to do other things, but still in education, administering. Like I worked in two UNESCO projects, one in Jamaica, it was Caribbean wide, in terms of curriculum development and using new devices and innovations in teacher education. And the other <coughs> was um, based in Barbados, and again it was a UNESCO project, but it was education for innovation for education development. So in this regard I find that even when I was away from education for a while, I did it in a different sort of way that gave me new experiences. Yes. Having said this, then perhaps I should make uh, two points before I get to the education. One is, during the period I worked in education, it is interesting, or maybe interesting, to point out that I worked with four ministers of education. Yeah, four. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, former minister Hunter J. Francois, mm -hmm. a former minister deceased of revered memory, Alan Busquet, and minister Kenny Anthony, former minister. Before he, yeah, he was minister for education. That's yes. right, for right. education. Yes. And former minister Louis George. Yes. Now, I mention this because I think I want to say that I enjoyed a very harmonious working relationship with all of them. Mm -hmm. And notwithstanding the fact that the political administration which they represented differed from yes. one person to the other and their own personal orientations and, and so the on. policies that they were prepared but to were implement. Able to work with all four. I was able yes. to work with all four. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as I reflect on our 25 years of um, independence, I think um, we have achieved much in education. Uh, in the first instance, I would like to indicate the reasons for my comments in terms of saying we've done remarkably well in education. If we think of the commission that was established after the riots in the 1930s to look uh, to report on the situation in the Caribbean at that time, in uh, education they indicated the schools were not enough to cope with the numbers and were in a bad state. With regard to teachers, they said they too were inadequate and their training was defective. With regard to the curricula, they said it was ill-suited to the mass of people that were served. Now, I think, although there may be some argument in respect of what has happened 
you know, over that period of time, or whether we can say the same thing with regard to today. My view is I don't think we can, because there has been major development with regard to schools, with regard to the training of teachers, and also with regard to the curricula. Uh, <clears throat> the other point that I want to make is another educator looking at the situation in the 1960s pointed out that as political responsibility and control passed into the hands of St. Lucians and as the prospect of economic development became a possibility. St. Lucians were prepare, pre preferring their own solutions to the development of education and I think the telling phrase is and lines of um, development were clear and consistent. Mm -hmm. Now <clears throat> I think it's because of, in first instance, the political development at that stage, leading to independence, and then getting the momentum of dependence, it has been carried forward to this day. Mm -hmm. Then we can look at a number of things that have happened during that period that didn't exist before. before. I see. And in the light of that, I'm saying there has been progress. Now, perhaps I can put that situation starkly by saying in the 1960s the government of the day applied and tried to argue for the establishment of a secondary school in Viewfort in the south and the reaction was when you think of the population of St. Lucia we are reasonably well served as compared with others with two secondary schools. So we're not seen worthy of much education? <laughs> was that it? So the entire but, island should be served by just two schools yes. and that was okay. But it is also making a point, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I could infer, you know, in terms of how right one was to move in the direction that of did. independence. Yes. You see, because the distance from the mother country and not only the distance it means the lack of understanding mm -hmm. of the aspirations of the people yes. you know um, meant that we had to press along in terms of saying that was necessary and we eventually got the school the government eventually got the school at Viewfort mm -hmm. but I raise this merely to show yes. what was the attitude yes. and if we look at that situation and look at it as of now, we can see that there has been tremendous expansion True. in this regard. Yes. And a different thinking, obviously. And a different thinking. Yes. And uh, not only this, because um, one also has to bear in mind as part of the different thinking that at that time, most people, and especially economists, were beginning to point out the relationship between education and national development and how we couldn't, you know, go very far in national development without, without paying attention, attention to education. Yes. So if we think of what has happened in that light, mm -hmm. we can say that we have not done badly, badly at all. in education. So you say independence was a thrust, it thrust the movement That's right. forward. And without that, who knows That's what right. would have happened to, 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 That's to education. Right. Yes. So <clears throat> I think this is what I really wanted to say, say. say yes. not only that we've gone far, right. but also uh, education has given yeah. an appropriate stimulus to national development. Yes. So, and also giving us a picture of what the education scene Indeed was, was like. Indeed, was like that was at like. the time. Now, um, I, I, I don't mean to embarrass you. Before the interview, I asked you about, uh, I gather there was a Calypsonian who had <laughs> taken issue with you. Yes. Mighty, mighty. I was yes. told to ask you about this. Yes. Um, what was the context? Were, were relations between yourself and, 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 and say, the, the teachers or the education system at the time strained? Uh, what gave rise? I think it was the second boss, I think yes. you were calling that. It was, it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> I took this in, in a light-hearted vein, you know, and uh, to the extent that at about this, that time, 
I remember a lot of the um, Calypso tents and uh, fun carnival took place at the, um, the banana shed in those days. Mm -hmm. And I was in the audience when that was being sung. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think, but during that time, it is expected that you would have problems yes. with um, teachers, with other persons in education, because one is moving in a direction, you know, one is innovating, one is attempting to, to introduce new ideas into the educational system. Mm -hmm. And, and for some people, that is threatening. I see. And there would be a certain measure of resistance. But of course, <clears throat> um, we tried. And uh, I came from a background where I made a specific study of the whole business of innovation and in introducing change within yes. a system. Yes. So I wasn't going to be easily um, deterred by my deterred by, <laughs> <laughs> by second boss. Yes. <laughs> so, so I assume that the, the boss then was the Minister of Education. Yes. And um, the second boss was the one who was making all of those demands on education. I see, which yeah, was on you. Teachers, which was me <laughs> okay. as Chief Education Chief officer. officer. I see. Well, all right. Now, speaking of innovation, um, you spent eight years at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College as principal. When you first went to the college, what sort of vision did you have? What did you want the, pro the college's project to be? Well, <clears throat> I think I'll have to go back a bit. When I was asked to <clears throat> take over the principalship of the college, I met with the College Board of Governors. And uh, prior to that, I was away for about five or six years, based in Barbados in that UNESCO project. So I had to meet with um, the chairman of the board and members of the board in order to get a vision of their aspirations for the college. What did they want for it? What did they want for that college? And I know that they were thinking of having a college, bringing a lot of the institutions together as one. And um, from the advice that they got, that that would have been economically more viable than the separate institutions operating as such. Now, from my own background at that time, I thought that... Um, you know, there was a lot of merit in this. And I read the report which was issued by a committee to the Minister of Education indicating what they had in mind in terms of a um, community college. I read that thoroughly and um, <clears throat> I was sympathetic to this point of view because in my studies abroad, especially in North America, I had done quite a bit with regard to the community college, the junior colleges and uh, whatnot. And I saw that as a good movement in terms of being able to provide a form of tertiary education, exactly. you know, in a manner that enables one to bring together several institutions. And I attempted to do this. And uh, <clears throat> I had um, looked at what happened in the in UK. At that time, they were thinking mainly in terms of secondary grammar school, secondary technical school, secondary modern school, and so forth. And then I looked at what was happening in the United States with their the junior schools, the senior schools, and I took a particular interest in the community college idea. Mm -hmm. And when I came and realized that they were interested in having that sort of institution, I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, perfect, yes. And um, it, um, I was very absorbed in the whole idea 
and in the work at the college at that time. What for you, what did it represent? What did it, um, what sort of potential did it present, the community college model for St. Lucia? Um, <clears throat> one, I think you had a number of distinct colleges at that time, the College of Technical, the College of Teacher Education and whatnot, plus other colleges in the community. And it looked like you needed to have an institution that would be recognized for its excellence, you know, and therefore be, as it were, a hallmark for the people of the community in the first place, mm -hmm. and also for the rest of the Caribbean to see that a small territory yes. can make a success of something like that. And therefore, I try to get things going and um, one of the early concerns uh, was um, the whole problem of if you're going to do that and follow it, you probably have to pay attention to three things. One, of course, the teachers. And then we began saying, what is it we need for the teachers? And we were able to put in place two major things. One was a salary scale, which was different from the rest of the salary scales. And therefore it became an attraction for teachers to feel they would want to work at that institution. The second thing, where large numbers of people work, the relationship must be governed in some way. Then we began to look at what are the regulations that would govern the teachers. And the third thing, if we're going to move towards excellence of some kind, we've got also to move our teachers to a higher level of professional competence and attainment. And in this regard, we were able to persuade the government to ensure that a certain number of scholarships were available to us so that we could have our teachers go and do further mm -hmm. and higher education courses abroad. And come back enriched. And come back yes. enriched. Yeah. So these were three important planks to begin with in order to set that whole platform for the takeoff. What do you think about the college's status now? Um, has it veered off it, the path that you just outlined? <coughs> has it improved um, since, you know, you've left uh, quite, for quite some time now, but what's your view of it now, looking back? Well, <clears throat> I think that they have built on a lot of the things that we had done. <coughs> I don't know that they have discarded many, you know, but I'm quite impressed that they've been able to maintain standards and probably carry that even further, you know. The other thing that I sort of can say about the college, because I don't have a lot of other um, information about it is, it did seem to us when I was there <clears throat> that we needed to have an assessment of what we are doing at the college after a period of time in order to say, what ought we to be doing? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then um, the board agreed and we invited ACTI to mount a Caribbean sort of group to come in and have an assessment of our college. And they did that uh -huh. and gave us the benefit of an evaluation of what they thought was going on. And what did they think? And that was very encouraging. Really? They were positive? Very encouraging. Yes. Very encouraging. And you shared in that assessment? I shared in that assessment. Okay. You know? So I thought that was very good. Now, <clears throat> the interesting point to your question there too is that um, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, I've always felt that I would be at the college for a certain while and leave the college because of my conviction mm -hmm. that you need different people with different skills at different times in the development of an educational institution. Mm -hmm. So I left at a particular point <clears throat> and then came, you know, another principal and then we had the mm -hmm. third principal yes. now. And I think I, with the information I have available, I feel very well about the achievements of the college, mm -hmm. the direction in which it has gone, and some of the things that it has done. Um, 
of course, there will always be problems. Yes. And I've read some of those in the local press <laughs> yes. in terms of what's happening. And I think with a large institution like this, it is always difficult in order to deal with a lot of problems. And some of the problems <coughs> um, are financial, but in order to get over the financial problems, you have to do certain things which in the immediate run would appear short-sighted yes. to members of staff and others, but in the long run to do something else. Mm -hmm. If you have available some money and there are difficulties in obtaining money, insufficient amount from government to do the kinds of things that need to be done, and then one has to be very careful. What do we do? You can spend this money easily on a number of things and then have nothing to show for it. And then you can do other things to be able to say, we need structures that would facilitate our students, that would enable them to work better, that would enable us to introduce new courses. And to the extent that you can do this, you know, something is well done. But I think all institutions in my day, we had problems too. too yes. And I would imagine some staff probably felt I should be doing some other things yes. instead. And partly because of the reason that even if we're skilled, we can't do everything. Yes. And hence the reason why I feel it is important after a period of time for you have to have change so somebody with new skills mm -hmm. can take the college to a higher yes. level. And new eyes. Yes. yes. Now before we move on to a bit uh, about your career as a civil servant, I need to ask this question. Um, do you think we're seeing education too much as a panacea? For our problems. Every time you hear about economic development, you hear you need education, education. Mr. Thomas, we're now we have, I mean, triple, quadruple the number of schools, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so on island. Um, of course, Sir Arthur Lewis is there. It has expanded its programs. It, and as you said early in the interview, there has been tremendous progress as far as education is concerned on this island. What do we have to show for it in terms of the level of our development? Or are we expecting too much from education? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. And it takes me to a thought that has been bothering me for a long while. Despite the fact that we have had this tremendous development, I have been reflecting for some time and each time we have independence around, it becomes a heavier burden on me. And it is this, that the behavior of our people would seem to suggest, and here I'm referring mainly to adults, because the established institutions have been taken care of granted they've got the deficiencies and that needs to be addressed. But by and large, there is a setting, there is an environment, there is a process by which you can deal with that. But what I find is, in the behavior of our adults, we don't seem to be able to see that they have some appreciation for what freedom really is and what, what discipline means. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't make sense really to say our community requires schools to do a certain thing, to transmit certain values, and then the adults in the community are not exemplars of those values that they're saying mm -hmm. the school ought to communicate. The result is that there is this disconnection and students who are in school and required to behave in a certain way don't see a reflection in the adults out of school behaving in the manner that they're told they, they ought to, to behave. Yes. And that is quite a big problem in this society. And I think we need 
to educate our people. But here's that word more. again, Mr. Thomas. Yes, we have been. Yeah, <laughs> but I think, yes, but when we talk about education, in the minds of so many people, they're talking about schooling. Mm, formal education. Yeah. Formal. Yes. <laughs> you know, education. So how else? The business yeah. of going through a school. Mm -hmm. And when we think of an age in which we live, and we hear of adult education, and we hear education is not something that finishes with school. It starts and it goes right on. We think of various ways in which people have um, devised structures to facilitate adults to inform and educate themselves. Mm -hmm. Then we really have to begin to say, to help people realize what freedom is all about mm -hmm. and what discipline is all about. By that I mean, freedom is not merely to say, you know, um, we have been freed from the shackles oh, yes. of whatever of that colonialism may be, or whatever, or whatever yes. it is. But it's also not freedom fr from only, but freedom to, to do something, something. to achieve something. Mm -hmm. And I think to do something, and especially to achieve something, requires the discipline. Mm -hmm. And therefore these twin concepts, you know, seem to me to be important pillars that should be part of our adult education program mm -hmm. so that every community would have a new thinking in terms of what freedom is, mm -hmm. a new thinking in terms of how important it is to discipline ourselves in order to be able to achieve and help in the development of what you're saying, yes. true development, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, um, in this regard, we have been concentrating a lot on the schools. We need now to focus on the people because we have to think in terms of that behavior. And it has become, I mean, a truism in terms of saying it is the adults that influence the young. Yes. So if we have the adults doing the right things in their communities, mm -hmm. you know, and then I think they become exemplars for their students and then there is less of that disconnection. And there's change. Yeah. Yes. So <clears throat> I think I would like to hope that in this regard we can inspire our people mm -hmm. by some kind of strategy, you know, in the whole process of understanding freedom, mm -hmm. you know, in both its senses, yes. freedom from and, and freedom, freedom to, to. Yes. you know, okay. and all the same time the importance of discipline in terms of we can achieve practically nothing unless we are disciplined, we have a disciplined approach, a disciplined mind, and I think we've got to do something, mm -hmm. you know, about to help that. about that. Okay, now every time we think of independence, or most of us, I think, we think of country, service to country, pride in country, and of course that is epitomized in my mind anyway, the civil service, the public service, it's, which is not supposed to be tied to political uh, feelings and so on. And I think your own civil service uh, career, uh, career as a civil servant, Mr. Thomas, exemplifies that. You mentioned earlier you'd served with four different <laughs> ministers for education. You were also a member of the Senate. You'd mm -hmm. also been appointed to, to sort of guide the public sector reform process. Mm -hmm. For you, um, how do you regard the public service today and the whole idea of being a civil servant, really serving country rather mm -hmm. than political cause or political ideology. Do you see that waning, that sense of service to the public and service to the common good? Uh, <clears throat> well, that's not a difficult one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a matter of trying to find out how I phrase it. Um, <clears throat> Let me sort of put it this way. I don't think the momentum that was envisaged in terms of public service reform has been achieved. Mm -hmm. That's my own assessment, yes. assessment of this. Now, <clears throat> some of us tend to un underestimate the value of the civil service in the economy mm -hmm. and social structure yeah. of a country. And it seems to me that the public service reform is an important um, vehicle that we can use 
in order to set a group of people, an organization that a government has some control over mm -hmm. to be right. Because that organization serves the public. The public has certain perceptions of that organization. As the organization grows, then problems become a little greater. And yet we live in an age where we've got to help people to move from a certain paradigm that they were used to in the past to a new paradigm. And in order to do that, it means we really have to have a public service reform where people can deal with that. I am aware that maybe some of the rules and regulations are obsolete and need changing. But then one should not use this as an excuse to sort of get away from regulations completely. Because where people live and work in order to do that harmoniously, there must be the kind of regulations, there must be the con kind of conventions that they respect. And that is where I think I wanted to make the point that when I worked with four ministers, you know, it is over a period of time. And granted, change is probably much more rapid now than it was then. But there were changes that required us to make adjustments as we went along. But there were certain things we accepted as given in respect of behaviors mm -hmm. on the part of public servants. And, <clears throat> and not only when I talk of behaviors, I'm not just merely talking in terms of ethical behaviors, I'm also talking in terms of strategies and processes mm -hmm. that should be used in the course of their work, you know, so that at least, you know, they can carry forward, you know, the new civil service, mm -hmm. the new facilities, that they need to be able to get the government ticking yeah. and get the economy it's ticking, ticking. Yeah. and then have the support and the respect of the community that as they, they do that. Yes, and the public that they serve. Yeah. Yes, so th that's your take on it. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Thomas, you were recently, Dr. Thomas, I have to say, <laughs> before we wrap up, we must talk a bit about your, your uh, recent honor. You were given an honorary Doctor of Laws, I believe it was, yes. from the University of the West Indies. Um, how do you feel about things like that? I mean, you've got no, you've been the recipient of an OB, even a knighthood. Um, you're also not yet. Not, not yet. yet. I saw it. Oh, yes, saw it from, on the, your, yes. from the church. Yes. That's right. From yes, from His Holiness. The right. Pope. That's how, right. How, how does that make you feel? I mean, it's obvious you feel good about it. But what does it really mean to you in real terms? Well, it's a it's a recognition of the the value of the services I've rendered in various fields and it is also a recognition not only of the value but also of the effect of that kind of contribution. The impact that it can have. The impact that it can have. I am usually reticent about talking about these because for every one person who has been so recognized you know, one can say there are lots of other persons who are working who hard also yeah. are working hard and need to be recognized. Mm -hmm. So I certainly don't want to gloat into yes. this. But at the same time, I am grateful, you know, that um, I have been um, recognized in that way for the contribution that I've made. And for example, this coming from the University of the West Indies, our University of the West Indies, at this time, I've said it before, and I think it is a recognition of what has happened in education in St. Lucia also. Okay. You know, and um, <clears throat> because I have worked in one capacity or another with the university over 40 years in a variety of ways. I mean, mm -hmm. as chief education officer, from the time the college was started, Teacher Education College, that is, even before mm -hmm. the amalgamation and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and various other colleges. I've worked in that respect. I've worked with um, university um, lecturers 
involved with CARICOM, involved with, um, with uh, various other groups like technical mm -hmm. groups and so forth, involved with CXC. You know, I have over the years continuously yes. worked in some way or other with the University of the West Indies. So that is merely saying that the University of the West Indies, in fact, has had an opportunity over a period of time to assess the quality of my contribution yes. to education. Yeah. And I'm grateful that For they that. have recognized yes. me in that way. And it, almost in a way, St. Lucia's, as you said, strides yeah. in education, yes. you know, by extension. Yes. Okay, final thoughts, Mr. Thomas, on independence, 25 years. Um, throughout this interview, it's obvious that your, your contribution has been very much education, civil service, but what marks it is a commitment to country. Mm -hmm. Yes, and not just individual um, ambitions and so on. Yes. For you, how do you feel about this particular um, landmark independence celebration, 25 years, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you know, it's easy to criticize, you know. Sometimes I, I keep on saying, um, has it been sufficiently um, the has the importance of twenty five years of independence been sufficiently well articulated that people understand what has happened over the twenty five years and why that has happened over twenty five years? In fact, that is a summation of some of the things that I have said before mm -hmm. in terms of not only the progress that we have made, but what development is all about, yeah. you know. <clears throat> and therefore, I don't know, I'm probably I'm not sufficiently in the know. I don't get the impression, you know, that um, people are sort of geared to think well yes. about their country, to think sufficiently well about what is happening, and that 25 years means something mm -hmm. to them. And this is what I would have expected, right. you know, to, not to have that. happened. Yes. And I don't think I, I'm getting, getting that. Which is that a commentary is, itself. That is my perception. Yes. I, I haven't heard the comments of others on mm -hmm. this, but it might be interesting. But um, I would have thought that... Um, you know, um, we'd have spared no pains in order to get all sections of the community all to sort of be involved, you know. And I know it's easier said than and done, yes. you know. So that at least it cannot be said, you know, that everything wasn't done yes. in order to ensure that people understood the meaning of this. Yes. Um, one. The other thing that I want to say about um, this 25 sort of years, that is an important milestone. And it could have been an opportunity to galvanize people in terms of where we want to go for the next 25 years, yeah. you know? And I think um, <clears throat> that is important even if we don't get there, we need a vision. Yes. Because, again, it comes back to what I was saying earlier, that as a result of independence itself, you know, we're saying there was a clear direction in which education was moving mm -hmm. and the lines of development were consistent. Right. I'm not saying they are any more consistent or less consistent now, but we would have liked you know, to, to, to make sure that you wanted people mm -hmm. to participate mm -hmm. and understand the direction in which, you know, we're going. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, how... is the way I, I see it. But like everything else, I think it's easy, easier said, said than, than done. done. Well, we'll have to leave it here, Mr. Thomas. We know we're actually out of time. Yes. But it has been very stimulating, and I've learned a whole lot. Thank you so much for being on the program. Pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very much.